Hi guys, in this video we will look at the Wittig reaction. This is a reaction that converts essentially an aldehyde or ketone into an alkene. And so essentially the oxygen of the aldehyde or ketone is replaced with a carbon. Of course, when we make an imine, the oxygen of the outer hydro ketone is replaced with a nitrogen imine. Before we look at the Wittig reaction, though, let's look at a couple of miscellaneous applications of imines. And from the other handout we're working with, I wanted to show the oxidative dealkylation of amines or drugs that contain amines, the oxidation that can take place in the body. And this is actually the exact reverse of a reductive amination sequence. Now the reductive amination sequence begins with an aldehyde or ketone. We make an imine and then the imine is reduced to the amine. If we go reverse here, we can oxidize an amine back to the imine. Now that's actually a little bit difficult in the lab, but your body does this very easily. All right? And once we get back to the imine, we can then hydrolyze the imine back to the outer hydro ketone. But we also produce that amine, the original amine. And so if we go backwards in this example here, we can effectively remove this group, okay? Remove this alkyl carbon from that nitrogen and replace it with an H. And the secondary amine, when the one alkyl group is replaced with an H, goes to a primary amine. So we lose an alkyl group. dealkylation coming this way. Actually going forward we can consider it an alkylation of the nitrogen if you focus on that because we added an alkyl. Alright, there's a couple of different ways to to consider or talk about what's going on here. Reductive amination sort of focuses on the aldehyde ketone, but alkylation focuses on the fact that we add an alkyl group to this nitrogen. The alkyl carbon used to be a carbonyl. You need to really get this figured out, what's going on here. It's not that difficult, it just takes a little bit of time and specific focus. So, if we go backwards, we can remove an alkyl from the nitrogen. And that's what happens with a number of drugs in the body that contain amines, like amphetamine. The body can oxidize and we can get an imine here. Okay, we're removing two H's. That is an oxidation. Your body does this with oxidizing enzymes. And then the imine can be hydrolyzed. And this carbon with the double bond N can be converted back to the carbon double bond O. All right. And we release the nitrogen. All right. In this case, it's going to be released as NH3. Coming forward, ammonia would react with this to give this imine. Now, depends on which molecule you want to focus on. The nitrogen has one alkyl group here, now has no alkyl groups. It's been dealkylated. We can also focus on the other organic, or the, the carbon fragment, and we see that that carbon becomes a carbonyl. 
all depends on which of these two products here are the largest or the most significant. The example below, imipramine, a tricyclic antidepressant, in the body, one of these methyl groups is removed, dealkylated. That is done by an oxidation between the nitrogen and carbon to make double bond, right? Between nitrogen and carbon to make double bond. Then this imine, by the way, this nitrogen has to be positive for it to make an imine, hydrolyzed carbon becomes carbonyl and the nitrogen picks up an H. Of course this would give formaldehyde. And with the methyl removed this is called desipramine. Uh, the D is sort of coming from dealkylation or demethylation in this case. Um, so it's called an oxidative dealkylation. And by the way, amipramine is actually a prodrug. It's actually not the active drug. It first has to be oxidized and dealkylated before it then is active as an antidepressant. So this is a metabolism, a root of um, a me metabolic root. Okay. Lots of applications of imines. Here is a synthesis, a drug synthesis. Compound one. Uh, you can look this paper up if you'd like. I can't recall offhand uh, its activity, but in terms of making compound one, right here and going from six to eight is a reductive amination sequence. We have this aldehyde, all right, they're not drawing in the H there, it's kind of odd. Uh, primary amine, make imine here. And then it would have double bond, nitrogen, carbon, double bond. But then that is reduced immediately because they included sodium cyanoborohydride. All right. So there is an example of a reductive amination. By the way, there's some other chemistry here, the ester. Uh, by the way, this, this is a imi, uh, hydrozone, but then it, it sort of does a, uh, a cyclization. Um, it's a Fischer indole synthesis, but it does involve first making a hydrozone. All right, very unique reaction. Uh, from there, the ester is reduced to the alcohol using lithium aluminum hydride, but then the alcohol is oxidized to the aldehyde. Now in our class we used, what reagent did we use to do that? We used PCC, pyridinium chlorochromate. They're using um, a unique concoction here, it's called a Swern oxidation. Um, we have not covered that. It's, it's an advanced sort of method for converting a primary alcohol to an aldehyde. All right. Then from there, they do the reductive amination, aldehyde reacting with the amine in the presence of sodium cyanoborohydride. Okay. Couple of uh, applications there. Let's look at the Wittig reaction. Wittig reaction was discovered and developed by uh, George Wittig, who won Nobel Prize in 1979 
for his work in developing this chemistry. Uh, there's actually a Wittig reaction in the lab manual and it shows a photo of uh, Wittig, a German chemist. Um, he actually shared the Nobel Prize that year with H.C. Brown who developed sodium borohydride. And the Wittig reaction essentially converts a carbonyl to an alkene. All right. Here's a example reaction. We take an aldehyde or ketone and we react it with this phosphorus compound. Here we have a phosphorus carbon double bond. And that is called a phosphorus ilid. All right. And we get the alkene here. Now, and we generate here triphenylphosphine oxide. Phosphorus double bonded to oxygen. Phosphorus under nitrogen makes five bonds. Well, it has five valence electrons. It can make five bonds. Phosphorus here can expand its octet. So we have a phosphorus with three benzene rings. It could have a lone pair, and that would look like nitrogen, but it can also make two additional bonds. Two, four, six, eight, ten electrons around the phosphorus, but that's okay because phosphorus has d orbitals and it can again expand its octet. Now this is sort of, let's see what's going on here. It's sort of like exchanging partners here. If we cleave right here, the carbon double bonded to phosphorus and the carbon has a methyl. Over here, carbon double bonded to oxygen. Basically, they switch partners and the oxygen becomes double bonded to the phosphorus. And the carbon becomes not double bonded to phosphorus, but becomes double bonded to this carbon. All right. And so we get that carbon carbon double bond formed. And that's sort of the way you sort of visualize what's going on in the Wittig reaction. But we also need to know the mechanism. How, do we, how does that swapping of partners there happen? All right, let's look at the phosphorus ilid. An ilid is a strange name for a, a net neutral, okay? It's a neutral molecule. But it has two charges, and they are adjacent to each other, so it's one, two. Now, where are the charges? I don't see any charges. That's because this is a resonance structure of the ilid. It goes by two different resonance structures, okay? It's as if I'm, uh, you know, red and white. All right, it's the same old story. The true color is pink. And if I said, okay, let's talk about this, you know, this white color here, you would say, well, isn't the true color pink? Yes, it's the true color's pink. Why are you saying white? Well, you mean to talk about the red color? I could talk about it. It's neither red or white. It's pink. Well, then you might say, well, why not just talk about the pink color? Well, that's that hybrid thing that's hard to visualize. So we talk about one of these. And then the beginning student will be very confused, like, well, why are you talking about these when the true structure is neither of these? Well, yeah, you got to understand this. We've been developing resonance for two semesters now. Okay. 
So here I'm showing you the red or white, you know. It's not that. Here's a resonance structure. It's also not this. The true structure is somewhere in between these two. But if you look at this resonance structure, we can see the two charges. Plus and minus right next to each other. So it's one, two. Net neutral, though. Now, some people, some chemists may show the illid like this all the time. Some may show it like this all the time. This is actually the preferred resonance structure when we show it, like in a line reaction. But this resonance structure is the one you want to use and show in your mechanism. This resonance structure also conforms to the octet rule for phosphorus. It only has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. So if you don't like to expand octets, you would prefer this resonance structure. Now we can go from here, take these electrons and move them in. How do you stabilize a positive? Move electrons towards it. Okay, that would give this. We can do that again because phosphorus can make five bonds. Now this is the major resonance structure because there are more bonds. But this structure does contribute and we see that this carbon has some carbanion character. Thus it has some nucleophilic character. All right. Now I showed resonance there in blue. Let's do mechanism. I'll do it in red. Now the mechanism involves this carbanion. You see it there? Again, there's carbanion character here. We see it from this resonance structure. If you want to get back this way, we'll just move the pi bond back here, and that gets us back to this. Okay, carbonion character. This acts as a nucleophile and adds to your carbonyl. Electrons up. And that gives. All right, let's draw this very precisely. We have draw the methyl and the let me put the methyl down. Put the phosphorus up and it has three phenyls. It's positive. Methyl down. Let's clarify this methyl with ME on the end. And we just made this bond by that carbon attacking the carbonyl and electrons up onto oxygen. And that becomes a negative oxygen. And the carbonyl carbon had a phenyl and the methyl on it. And I'm just going to leave that as a line here. Um, <clears throat> it really doesn't matter. But try to distinguish between the methyl that's on the, the ketone versus the methyl that's on our phosphorus illid. Okay, we get to this point. That's just nucleophilic addition of the carbanion from the illid attacking the carbonyl. But at this point... What could happen next? Well, physics and chemistry tells us that the negative is going to be attracted to the positive. And what happens next is these electrons add here. And that will give
I don't like that. Let's put in these methyl, methyl there. Uh, we will get this here. And now the phosphorus is neutral. It has five valence electrons. Oxygen is neutral. But this is NaF, not actually formed. <clears throat> uh, is that right? Is it NaF? Is it, is it known? No, I can't quite remember. Uh, it seems like certainly it could be concerted. Uh, we'll need to confirm that. But we get to this four-membered ring here. Okay. And at this point, this then collapses... to give our two final products. Now oxygen loves to bond to phosphorus. All right, there's certain elements that really have strong bonding. Silicon and fluorine make strong bonds. But this oxygen wants to bond again, and we can start with this here. If we move these electrons here, well then something has to leave the phosphorus. Well, these electrons can sort of be pushed away, and they can actually move down here. Well, carbon can only have four bonds, so something has to leave carbon. Well, these can move up on the oxygen to become the oxygen second lone pair because the other lone pair moved in and moved, made bond to phosphorus. All right. But that sort of decomposition pathway leads to, well, we have that. But right here, we made double bond there. This carbon has a methyl. It also has an H, okay? This carbon has a methyl and a phenyl. And then we also formed this. But now the phosphorus is just double bonded to the oxygen. Okay. Now this four-membered ring here, um, has a name. Let's see. I believe I know what it is. Let's check the old textbook. Ah, chapter 20. Yes, yes. It's actually not the name that I was thinking. That's why I was a little bit uh, hesitant. Yeah, yeah, it's called an oxa... Oxophosphatane. Okay. 
Um, but the oxophosphatase undergoes a decomposition. It's a, it's a four-membered ring that would have a little bit of strain. Uh, it's also driven by entropy, one molecule breaking down into two. But here is your alkene. And we said, as above, okay, I've just got it turned here, yeah. Now, one limitation of the Wittig, uh, it gives a mixture of the alkene isomers when possible, usually. In some specific cases, you can get a, a stereoselective outcome, but very often it's a mixture of the E and Z isomers. Uh, I see the, the Klein textbook is showing this as a concerted. Okay, so they are showing it NAF. Yes. Um, it would be considered a cycloaddition, all right? They're, they're adding together to make a ring, all right? Sort of like a dills alder you have two reactants that, that add together and make a ring. And typically cycloadditions are concerted. Um, In organic one, I use the uh, the approach of NAF, not actually formed, not actually formed. This is not an intermediate. All right, this, both of these steps happen at the same exact time. Um, but the mechanism is for, fairly straightforward once you see it. All right. Again, this resonant structure is good for just seeing how we can, instead of the carbon double bonded to phosphorus, it becomes double bonded to the carbonyl compound or the carbonyl carbon. But this resonant structure is, is best for uh, visualizing and showing your mechanism because it has the carbanion here, which initiates the reaction. And this is kind of clever. That oxygen there is right next to that uh, positive phosphorus, all right? And then the driving forces uh, lead this to break apart and give your alkene. Okay, the ilid, and by the way, the ilid, all right, is often called your Wittig reagent. Now the ilid is made a two-step process from an alkyl halide reacting with triphenylphosphine. And here the phosphorus has three bonds and one lone pair like a nitrogen. All right, Phosphorus is a pretty good nucleophile. We don't see it used that much. But backside attack, all right, SN2, we get this structure here. Phosphorus is positive and then we got a B or a minus to balance that. But now if we come in with a base, we can deprotonate one of these CHs, all right? And a variety of bases can be used. Something as strong as N-butyl lithium, we can even use uh, hydroxide or phosphate, all right? Um, I'll show hydroxide. These electrons take an H, these electrons stay behind, and that gives the ilid. Of course, we can show the double bonded resonance structure, all right, if we want. Why can we deprotonate the CH? Well, the molecule then becomes neutral. The anion is also resonance delocalized because, again, phosphorus can accept more electrons because it has d orbitals. 
and when we show resonance it's kind of odd we're like well where's the negative at well it's net neutral it's still net neutral okay but the electrons have a place to to move into and the carbon then becomes positive in this resonance structure so triphenylphosphine and then we have a base all right and then if we use potassium hydroxide we would also create here you know potassium bromide as a byproduct plus plus yes that's right we also made water so depending on what base you use there um so that's how you make your Wittig reagent. And then at this point, you would throw in your aldehyde or ketone, and usually all this is done in the same flask. For example, um, or a lot of times you make this, okay? It's called a phosphonium salt. Sometimes people will call that the Wittig reagent, but you need a base to actually form this. So it, it can vary. Sometimes people will only call this the Wittig reagent or, or maybe this. So here we can kind of combine. Starting here, you take your phosphonium salt. KOH is the base that actually forms the, the ILID. This is certainly your ILID because it's now doubly charged. The ilid is formed in situ, and as soon as it's formed, it then, it then reacts with the outer hydro ketone via the mechanism we showed, and that gives your alkene. And so we can sort of all combine it, starting with the phosphonium salt. And there is a lab in the lab manual that does start with a phosphonium salt. It's the phosphonium chloride aldehyde or ketone, in this case aldehyde, and we include potassium phosphate to generate the ILID. And in this particular reaction, everything is done by grinding. Um, it's kind of a neat concept, uh, but we're not doing that reaction this semester. But you still might want to take a look. Okay, and when you make your product, the triphenylphosphine has to be purified out um, because it is a substantial organic product. But it's fairly easy to purify out because it's fairly polar. If you do a short column, your alkene will often move through the column, silica gel column, but the triphenylphosphine will not move, certainly not as quickly. Okay. Um, for homework, you can show a product there, pretty straightforward. We already have an illid. Again, keep in mind, you may see a reaction like this in which the illid has to be generated by reacting with the base. Now, we can also consider synthesis. Synthesis of alkenes, all right? The Wittig reaction is a great way to make an alkene, starting from a carbonyl compound. So show a Wittig synthesis of the following alkenes. Keep in mind, if you want to go backwards, you cleave the alkene, back to a carbonyl compound and a ilid with the carbon double bond phosphorus. All right. Maybe we can do that. Some random alkene. Let's just take, you know, this here.
Um, I mean, you see an alkene, you say, hey, I can make that. I can cleave that. This side will be carbonyl. Of course, that's an aldehyde, so I like to draw in the H. And the other side will be... All right. And if you want to put an H here, you can. It's really not an aldehyde, but... One carbon becomes double bonded to oxygen. The other carbon becomes double bonded to phosphorus. Right? You want to come this way. You know which way you want to go. Um, so you can think about that here. What carbonyl compound, all right, we need a CO compound and we also need a phosphorus illid. And the phosphorus illid is going to be our carbon double bond P. Now usually your illid would be the less substituted side. If possible. of the alkene, okay? Because, keep in mind how you make the illid. The illid is made ultimately starting with an SN2, all right? And so this carbon, you would like it to have only one substituent uh, or be primary. If it was secondary, your SN2 would be more difficult. Still doable, but preferentially you would like for the illid to have a primary carbon. And indeed, the, in the example up here, of the two carbons of our alkene, the less substituted carbon came from the illid. And that's, that's usually the approach that's taken. All right. Now, so we can make compound B here by a Wittig reaction. Now, back in organic one and early in organic two, we could have also made compound B using different chemistry. For example, if we had this alcohol here, we could dehydrate it by an E1 mechanism using acid, and we could get compound B. But in this reaction, the other alkene isomer would actually be the major product because it is the most substituted alkene. It's the thermodynamic product. E1 always gives the most stable alkene. So if we tried to make compound B by this route, it would be a minor product. And that's one of the powerful uh, things about the Wittig reaction. It's very regioselective. You get the alkene exactly where you want it. where this particular reaction you're going to have isomers and you, your alkene you want may not be the major product. Now, by the way, how could you make this compound? Well, we could start with this ketone, react it with a Grignard. All right. And with H plus workup, we would get this and then we could dehydrate it. So that's more traditional chemistry to add a carbon here and get the to get this carbon double bonded to another carbon. 
But again, you have regioselectivity issues here. All right, but that is a little bit of review of some for older chemistry in terms of an approach to getting an alkene from a carbonyl compound. All right, so a little homework there. We'll look at those in class. And uh, there is an example of a Wittig in this synthesis here. It's a modification of the Wittig called a Wittig-Bowden reaction or process. All right. Uh, the Bowden process, I believe, is where we use uh, uh, the particular base here and a crown ether. It's just conditions. Essentially a Wittig reaction. Um, and so here, uh, tin is a phosphonium salt. The potassium carbonate is included to generate the illid. And then the illid reacts with the benzaldehyde to give this alkene. It is a mixture of E and Z isomers. That's kind of what the squiggly line indicates. A lot of uh, also how the squiggly line indicates racemic. And they're indicating an E and Z ratio of one to one. All right. They also show synthesis of the phosphonium salt from this benzyl chloride. All right. They also show uh, synthesis of the benzyl chloride from the alcohol using thionyl chloride. We've seen that before. And then they show another Wittig. They also give a little, little data here, making the phosphonium salt 16. Uh, I'm not sure why they given data here. I have to read the entire paper. Different solvents, times, yields. Although their yields do vary a good bit, looks like uh, DMF. At reflux gave good yield. Yep, and that must be why here they showed DMF at reflux. Um, over here they're showing some E to Z ratios of their Wittig reaction product. And it seems to vary based on the R groups on the phosphonium salt and also the solvent used. More selective with THF towards the E. Um, compared to toluene. Okay. In any event, there's a, there's a paper uh, that, that has some good discussion of the, uh, the Wittig reaction and the experimental protocol uh, that was developed here. Uh, the very first reaction, I see it has a check mark here. It looks like this aniline is reacting with acetic anhydride to make the acetamide. Yeah. Oh, we've done that reaction too. Each, each one is checked. Uh, it looks like NBS. It's a benzylic bromination. Uh, uh, this is a peroxide here. Okay. 
Then once we get the leaving group on, react with triphenylphosphine, make the phosphonium salt, and then we can do the vitig reaction, including the base, to generate the illid. Okay, guys, that's the vitig reaction. A couple more miscellaneous uh, application pages here as we move into the next um, chemistry outline.